really um, a pleasure for for me, and I, I hope it will be for you to uh, to listen to um, to Hector's uh, presentation today. Um, so um, Hector uh, Hector Galvez Lopez um, is um, has a background in um, in biotechnology engineering. Um, he had complete a uh, master degree in bioinformatics uh, in the Department of uh, uh, Plant Science in McGill uh, in uh, 2017. Um, the same year, uh, he joined us at C3G as a bioinformatics consultant in the service team of, um, of Francois Lefebvre. Um, two years ago, um, he was promoted as a bioinformatics specialist uh, in my team was in charge of um, the bioinformatics technological development um, uh, at the center. Uh, Hector uh, is a really um, great uh, bioinformatician. He has experience in uh, genome assembly, transcriptome, methylation, short and long wing uh, sequencing uh, technology. Uh, in my group, he is now uh, responsible of the analysis part of the COVSIC uh, consortium, uh, which will be um, mainly the focus of the talk today, and is also strongly uh, implicated in the Concogene Virus uh, Consortium, which is uh, similar to what we've done in COVSIC, but at the um, um, Canada uh, levels. So um, I, I'm pleased to, um, to let uh, the, the mic to Hector, and uh, I, I'm sure you will enjoy his, um, his presentation. Thank you, Mathieu. Thanks for the introduction. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so thank you for coming to this talk. As Mathieu mentioned, uh, the talk will be focused on the VirusSeq project that is uh, also known as CoSeq project and the work that we have been doing at the McGill Genome Center, uh, specifically throughout the year 2020. So. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank you all for coming and I hope uh, you find this talk interesting um, because it, it, it was a very interesting year for sure. Um, so I will start with a phrase uh, for those of you that are native English speakers. Uh, this is a common phrase. It's hindsight is 2020. Uh, but for those of you that are not familiar in, with this phrase, it just means that choices that seem difficult in the past now seem very clear after you know what happened as a result of your choices. And I think this is a very appropriate way to begin this talk, not just because you know the year 2020 and uh, uh, the pun, but also because uh, it applies very well to what we all lived through in the past year, last year and currently. Um, you know, there were very difficult choices that had to be made and uh, the results of those choices are now clear, but we need to remember that back then we didn't have the information that we have right now. So the objective of this talk is really to provide a timeline of the work that we have been doing at the McGill Genome Center, specifically the VirusSeq project or CovSeq project as it's also known. Um, and we will focus this talk mainly on the results that we have obtained uh, in the year 2020, uh, the lessons that we learned and also kind of placing it all within the context of the broad worldwide pandemic. So compared to other talks, this will be formatted a little bit differently because I will go in chronological order, kind of like recounting how the pandemic progressed um, month by month and in parallel showing the work that we were doing at the McGill Genome Center at, at that time. So back in January, 2020, um, you know, it, it's almost uh, more than a year ago now, but it's hard to remember, but it, it, it didn't start in January 2020. Unbeknownst to local and international authorities, um, by January 1st, 2020, some reports have placed a number of around 266, at least 266 patients in the Wuhan region had already contracted COVID-19 in the year 2019. So uh, at the time, obviously, it, the, the depths of the pandemic, uh, the start of the pandemic weren't known. But looking back, we can now see that it already by January 1st, there was a lot of things happening. Um, but it, it didn't really break into international media until January 2nd, when there were some reports uh, around the world and in, in China of 41 patients hospitalized with a mysterious pneumonia. 
And already there was a, a strong suspicion that it was being caused by an unknown coronavirus. By January 5th, the Chinese Centers for Disease Control and Prevention submitted a viral isolate from a patient uh, that was hospitalized in December of 2019 for sequencing. And that's the reason why already more than a year ago in January 10, there was a first public sequence of the what was then called 2009 NCOV that was uploaded to virological.org. So this is a, a blog that is maintained by a few virologists worldwide and that has become a very important source of open science and sharing results. Um, and it was the first place where this sequence was published and it was published for anyone to see and for anyone to download already in January 10 of 2020. Then two days later, that same sequence was submitted to GenBank and published with uh, the first accession number that was given here, um, uh, along with several other isolates that were also published in another uh, public data set called Gizade that is maintained by a German uh, research institute. So uh, one thing that I wanna highlight, even if it's just January, 2020, is that a lot of things were happening very fast and very openly, there was a lot of data that was being shared very openly. And it was thanks to this that only three days after the first published sequence was uploaded to Virological, that in January 13, a group at the NIH led by Dr. Barney Graham was able to provide the company Moderna with a template for an mRNA vaccine against the, these, this new coronavirus. And the reason why they were able to do this in such a fast turnaround was because there was open data being shared and because of they were had done previous work with other coronaviruses for this kind of vaccine. But all of this happened within you know the first 15 days of the year 2020. It wasn't until January 20th of that same month that the World Health Organization finally confirmed that the virus was human to human transmissible. So even before there was this official confirmation from the World Health, Health Organization, the scientific community had begun work on you know, a lot of these things that came much later down the line, but this work was crucial for us to be able to respond to the pandemic on time. By January 22nd, the Arctic Network published the first version of its Amplicon-based protocol and pipeline for sequencing this new coronavirus. And as you're gonna see down the line, this this first version and this pipeline are the backbone of the work that we have been doing even here at the Genome Center. And it was already published in January 22nd. Then by January 23rd, the, the preprint that was later turned into a nature article describing the virus was published in BioArchive and the virus given its official name SARS-CoV-2 because of its similarity to other SARS viruses. It was, of course, around this time that we had the first presumptive case in Canada in January 25th, which two days later was confirmed by the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. Um, it, it was a man who came back to Toronto from a trip to China, which included the Wuhan region. So before the first case was even detected in Canada, there was so much work being done uh, by the scientific community worldwide. It wasn't until January 30th that the World Health Organization finally declared this novel coronavirus a public health emergency of international concern. And with that, we move on to the second month of uh, 2020, which in some of the articles that I was reading in preparation for this talk, um, unfortunately, they name it kind of like the lost month. In terms of scientific development, some things were happening, but it wasn't as fast as in January 2020. And looking back, this could have been a really good time to kind of uh, get the things going, essentially. But unfortunately, now we see that it wasn't really the case um, for various reasons. And again, hindsight is twenty twenty. But I'm here just summarizing some of the more um, important points that I found for this month. Um, in February, early February, the Canadian federal government started evacuating Canadian nationals from Wuhan. And then there was a lot of news and a lot of um, concern about the Diamond Princess cruise ship where there was a severe outbreak um, at that time. A total of 32 Canadians would eventually test positive for COVID-19 in this cruise line. 
Then around that same time, we started seeing cases in British Columbia. And then, um, as you know, the federal government of Canada was bringing back uh, Canadians, uh, repatriating them from this cruise line and putting them in quarantine in Ontario. The, Quebec finally detected its first presumptive case, um, a 41 year old woman returning from Iran. And uh, two days later on February 27th, this presumptive case was confirmed. But one thing that strikes uh, me from this item is that the person that was infected came back from Iran. Of course, now we know looking back that by this time in February 2020, the pandemic had already spread very far up, uh, um, from China and there were already full blown epidemics uh, in Italy, in Iran. And that's where the first uh, case that was detected in Quebec and reported in Quebec actually came from, from Iran. It, in February 27, the first human to human transmission was confirmed in Canada. And then uh, key for our province, in February 29, the uh, semaine de relage or the spring break begins in Quebec. This is much earlier than any other Canadian province. But at that time, Canada only had 20 confirmed cases across the country. Um, in March 9, the spring break ends in Quebec. And we uh, it, it's only two days after the spring break period ends that the World Health Organization finally declares COVID-19 a worldwide pandemic. That same, that the day after this, uh, our Prime Minister Justin Trudeau began quarantine because his wife tested positive for the virus. And there are then, by then, a total of 17 confirmed cases in the province of Quebec. And we'll see this number climb uh, really fast as people start coming back from the spring break period. Um, in March 13, the Quebec government declares finally a public health emergency. And uh, a lot of public spaces are ordered to close. Classes are suspended and everything uh, in universities and CIGEPs are closed until March 30th. A lot of us might remember this day because it's usually also probably the last time we are we were working in our offices at McGill. So um, at that time, of course, the, the closure was expected to last only 15 days, but we will know, we all know that that wasn't the case. Um, March 16 is when the federal government announces a border closure, uh, which went into effect actually on March 18th. And they, they tell all Canadians abroad to come back into to the country. Um, and isolate uh, to avoid the spread of the virus. It was also the time when schools and daycare started shutting down in Quebec. And unfortunately, on March 18th is, was the first reported death confirmed by uh, COVID-19 in the province. And it was also, in, from a scientific perspective, when the final and current version of the genome sequence was uploaded to GenBank. Um, the federal government was also working a lot at this time, announced the, their emergency response benefit. And, uh, you know, towards the end of March is when things started becoming a lot more serious. The public health emergency was extended. There were already by March 20, a total of 130 confirmed cases in the province. But scientifically, also importantly, people kept working and improving on some of the protocols that we ended up using. So the Arctic Network uh, published the version three of their primer design on March 24th. And then they released the first candidate version of their pipeline by the end of that month. Uh, it was uploaded to GitHub. By then, Quebec had already reported a total of 67 COVID related deaths. So the pandemic was starting to grow at an exponential pace in our province. So we come into March and here I'm, I'm going to highlight the work that was being done at the Genome Center at uh, our group at C3G in green to kind of give you a sense of what we are doing when whilst the pandemic uh, keeps progressing. So by by April, we already knew that we would become involved um, in this project. So um, as the CDC begins recommending face masks and uh, millions of Canadians began applying for their emergency benefits, the McGill Genome Center actually received the first sample for sequencing on a, around April 12th. Um, it was a viral culture that is used uh, as a positive control. 
as well as a full plate of clinical samples that we will call plate nine. So the work begins right away and credits to uh, Yanis Ragusa's group and Sarah in that group as well for starting the, the first nanopore run the day after they, almost the day after they receive these samples. And the first run for the COPSEQ project was actually just a test of this viral culture, uh, the positive control to make sure that the, the protocols were, were in place to actually be able to sequence the virus at the center. Um, just around that time was when Quebec actually began recording more than 1,000 deaths attributed to COVID-19. So the pandemic was really growing at a very fast pace. Um, to the side here, I'm just showing you the numbers as the months progress so that you can actually get a sense of how fast things were happening back then. Um, on our end at the McGill Genome Center, the work continued and uh, uh, very fast as well. Uh, from April 22nd to 26th, the first clinical samples from that plate nine were sequenced using Nanopore. And then we also did an MGI run. For those of you that are not familiar, MGI is a short uh, read sequencer similar to the ones produced by Illumina, um, but uh, from a different company called BGI. So we did one run for M from MGI around April 24th using the same samples that we have been sequencing with uh, the Nanopore platform. It was also around this time in, <laughs> somewhere else in the world that Pfizer began its combined phase two, three clinical trials from the candidate mRNA vaccine. So already very early on, while, while everything was still just essentially beginning, um, there was this great scientific effort to produce a vaccine that started towards the end of April uh, with Pfizer, but obviously many other companies in parallel all developing their own vaccine candidates. So I'm gonna, take a, a slight turn right now and explain a little bit more about how the, the sequencing works uh, for the virus. So uh, as I mentioned before, we use a protocol that was developed by the Arctic Network a Consortium uh, that is specialized in um, uh, viral sequencing and, and uh, other kinds of um, mostly long read technology. So they developed this amplicon based strategy to, to be able to sequence the whole viral genome. And in this schematic, I show more or less how it works. So up here, you have the viral genome um, uh, that was published in GenBank that I mentioned earlier, and the different genes that compose it, you know, the annotated, the famous S gene, the, the spike protein is over here. Um, and then you have the scheme of primers that tile the whole genome to produce these amplicons that are also covering the whole genome almost from end to end. The amplicons very crucially have this overlap between them. So you have, for example, here, amplicon 47 that has a small overlap with amplicon 48 so that there are no gaps in the coverage and you are able to actually sequence the whole genome from end to end. Um, another protocol that we tested and we used for the MGI platform specifically that I just mentioned was one that's called CleanPlex by a company called Paragon Genomics. They also use a similar uh, strategy to the one developed by the Arctic Network, but their amplicons are much shorter, as you can see them down here in green. Um, these amplicons are much shorter because the Paragon uh, scheme um, differently to the one developed by Arctic was very short read focused. So the Arctic uh, am amplicons are more or less 450 bases in size, whereas the CleanPlex ones are much, much smaller than that. Um, to be able to capture the full amplicon mostly with one uh, uh, short read from an Illumina or an MGI instrument. And that's really the main difference between the two protocols. In the end, we ended up going with Arctic uh, for various reasons, but we tested at the Genome Center both of these protocols uh, before moving on. And uh, in parallel, while the lab was testing these protocols to prepare the samples for sequencing, we at the Bioinformatics Center, with uh, the help of uh, the tech dev team, we started looking into the pipelines. So for Nanopore, we use a nanopolish based pipeline, which is a kind of uh, software that was developed out of uh, Ontario, Jared uh, Simpson's lab, that uh, is used to detect variants in, in long read sequencing, like the one produced by the Nanopore instrument. Um, for MGI, we were testing a few different 
uh, varying colors, but the one that we ended up going with is called Ivar. And in those early tests, uh, you know, we were comparing the data that we had at the time, which was the nanopore and MGI runs that I had just that I just described. And we were comparing the variants that we were detecting in each. And one thing that we noticed right away, for example, was that when you used an IVAR, but without doing the primer trimming uh, for the amplicons, uh, we detected a few variants that we didn't see when we were using the nanopore uh, data. So that kind of also led us to develop, uh, improve our pipeline and kind of set the parameters that I think every group was doing in parallel, every bioinformatics group. Uh, but essentially, IVAR with, with the primer trimming feature um, turned on actually gave a full concordance almost between the, the, the nanopore and uh, MGI results, which is uh, something that we would expand on as we validated our pipelines. But this is kind of what we were doing in April 2020. In the end, we developed two main pipelines. So this is the Arctic pipeline for nanopol nanopolish or nanopore data. Uh, it's a schematic of how the pipeline works with some of the important parameters that we determined. Uh, just to brief overview, it starts with the base calling. So the nanopore instruments don't output actual uh, bases. They output signal data that you then have to base call. After doing the base calling, you do an alignment to the reference genome. And with that alignment, you do variant calling by a separate amplicon sets to avoid the overlapping uh, regions because they kind of introduce some, some noise into the, the variant calling process. So you actually do the variant calling separately and then merge the two variant calls to produce a consensus FASTA that will have the consensus sequence for the viral sample that you submitted. And then once you produce your consensus FASTA, you can get a lot of metrics and visualization kind of like uh, detecting the, the clade of the virus and all of that, that happens afterwards. But this is kind of like just a very top level description of the nanopore pipeline. And the Illumina pipeline, which was developed uh, again, working with short reads in general, MGI uh, and Illumina use the same basic pipeline structure. Um, uh, the development mostly happened by Paul in our group. It starts out in a very similar fashion. Um, here, this schematic also shows a step. We do this with the nanopore too, but it's not in the plot. Um, we remove host reads. So this is reads that might map to the human genome uh, that were probably from the patient the sample was taken from to avoid uh, privacy concerns. After removing these host reads, then you do trimming and alignment. It's very similar to what we are doing with nanopore. And then, um, one big difference between the nanopore and the Illumina pipelines is that with Illumina, because of the accuracy um, of the short reads, you can actually detect uh, very low variant alleles frequencies in, in the data. So we do variant calling separately from the consensus generation, just because when we do variant calling, we lower the threshold of the, the, the variants that we detect to include even very low variant frequency uh, to kind of get a sense of the uh, diversity of the virus in the sample. So the variant calling and the consensus generation are done separately and the variants that go into the consensus are only those that have a very high level of support across the sample to kind of just include the really um you would you would get a, like an average consensus out of the pipeline instead of just like the full diversity necessarily represented in the consensus but it, this pipeline has the flexibility that it produces both so we could analyze both in parallel um and you know these pipelines are are well were being developed by us, but they're implementations of pipelines and work that was done also in parallel by other groups across Canada and the Cancogen Consortium and across the world by people like the Arctic uh, Network and everyone that has been working in viral sequencing throughout the last year. So we were developing our pipelines, but the pandemic was still growing uh, by the start of May to the point where the Canadian federal government uh, announces an extra emergency uh, benefit for students uh, specifically. And then um, uh, we start getting a better sense of how the pandemic is uh, actually affecting people. And uh, unfortunately, by then, by May, it was very clear that the majority of the deaths and cases in, in Canada 
were being uh, were, were happening in Quebec, in the province of Quebec. Um, so uh, it was not until May, mid-May, that Canada officially starts recommending us to wear masks. So it, it now seems like something so normal, but back then at the beginning of the pandemic, there wasn't any official recommendation. Uh, the science was happening in parallel. We, it, we didn't know that masks would actually be as effective uh, to reduce the transmission when the pandemic was starting. And also in May is when we start uh, testing the Illumina platform for our sequencing. Um, we had done Nanopore and we had done MGI. Those same samples were now being run in Illumina using uh, the NovaSeq sequencer. And uh, the lab was also kind of like perfecting and developing uh, better techniques for reverse transcription and uh, using uh, some spike ins to kind of detect the, the the lower thresholds of how many variants we could actually get from the data. So all of this was happening in the lab. Um, towards the end of May, you can see it in the plot and you, I don't know if you remember, but as the weather improves and people start taking precautions, the numbers start to fall and the cases begin to plateau. So towards the end of May, the government starts allowing for private gatherings and outdoor activities to slowly resume. But also on our end, uh, we started receiving many more samples to kind of do a multi-technology validation analysis to compare all three platforms that we were developing at the time. So this validation analysis essentially consisted of 41 clinical samples that we were able to sequence with all three platforms, the MGI CleanPlex protocol and the Nanopore and Illumina platforms, both using the Arctic protocol for Amplicons. And, um, when we did this validation analysis, of course, we compared the variants that we were obtaining and their variant allele frequencies, and we saw that most of the samples had full concordance. 38 samples out of the, those 41 had full concordance. But of course, we were interested in the three that didn't. And you know, those three samples that had discordancies were actually very important uh, down the line because they helped us set the thresholds in our pipeline to have confidence in our results. So I'm showing a case of a sample that didn't have this concordance. And the reason for that we ended up figuring out was because of the allele frequency of one of the variants that was around 75%. That means 75% of the reads uh, across all three technologies had the variant and about 25% that didn't have the variant. So when we realized this, we kind of got in the, the importance of setting these thresholds properly and accounting for these sorts of things. And it was really this validation analysis and these discordant variants that allowed us to set the parameters and fine tune our pipelines to better represent the diversity of our of the variants in the in the calls, but also to better uh, have uh, a consensus that represents the the actual um, uh, sample that we received. And one thing that's also very important to notice is, uh, of course, MGI and Illumina are very very similar. They're both short read technologies. With Nanopore, given the the accuracy is much lower at a base level, you see the the the. Nanopore is not so good for detecting these low variant allele frequencies because already uh, it has such a big disparity across the variants. Um, and this is, was also confirmed using the spike ins that I mentioned earlier. The lab uh, here at McGill produced a gradient of spike ins using a clinical sample that we had already sequenced before and the viral culture that we were using as a positive control. So we knew we had a ground truth for the variants that were present in each of those samples. And then they produced this gradient where they added 1% of the spike in to the sample to 5% uh, of the spike in 10%, 50%. And that way we were able to see, and it was very encouraging because in the Illumina data in particular, um, you could see that, for example, when you have the 50% spike in, uh, and you have this variant that we know is in one of the samples, but it's not in the other, you have a distribution that is not exactly 50%, but it's 40%, 59%. And in the 20% spike in, we have 84% to 60% distribution of the variants. So it showed us that uh, as we followed the gradient that it really gave us confidence that, you know, we are able to pick up with some degree of confidence. Obviously it's not exact, 
but with some degree of confidence, even low variant allele frequency variants in our data. Hector, I, I have a quick question just so that I understand. Uh, this is yes. Yes. Um, yep. So low variant allele frequency, does that represent an infection with like a, uh, I guess a, a different, uh, a number of different viruses at the same time in the same patient? could have many causes and we the reality is that it would depend on every case because the re, the the variant the, obviously the virus is mutating uh, as it infects its host so as the mutations happen of course there could be some internal host diversity that is happening as the infection progresses but it could also be a case of you know multiple infections um, there are many potential causes for this so the, there's no one single answer to say why something like this would happen. So I, I know that in the case of something like HIV that, that does mutate very fast, uh, you do get this quasi species of, of kind of viral clouds that mutate within, within the host, but you know, that's partly because the infection is so prolonged. Here, the infection is usually very short and uh, this virus doesn't mutate that fast. So I was wondering if you have any insight as to, well, wh whether you, you know, you see the, these low allele frequencies often and what the cause, I, I guess you, you're saying you, you're not sure what the cause was, but I was, I was just wondering how often is this seen? So, you know, we don't always see them. They're not super prevalent in our data set majority of the variants that we detect are high allele frequency variants that make it all the way into the consensus. The low allele frequency variants definitely appear, but it's not, uh, you know, you don't have this huge diversity, at least not in our data set. One thing that we are finding out, obviously the science is still being done and there's still analyses that are being done. But one thing that is known is that people that have long uh, COVID, what's called long COVID or long-term COVID, tend to accumulate a lot more of these uh, variants throughout the progression of their disease. Whereas a person that just has a, you know, a normal two week infection say, or, or less than that, then they don't tend to have this much variety. But it, there's still a lot of work to be done specifically for this intra host diversity that is happening as we speak. So take this obviously with a grain of salt as we learn more. Thanks. Um, we move on to the summer and the summer, um, at least in Quebec, was a kind of like a, a, a break up for what happened in the spring. Uh, the positive cases started going down um, and the, the cumulative deaths started plateauing. So we saw a progression of reopenings uh, partial with obviously some restrictions, but uh, there was some change, at least in the way that we lived through the pandemic. Um, in parallel, at the Genome Center, we were very busy completing our pilot phase of the project. Um, we did the validation analyses with these three uh, technologies. We compared them, and we decided that we were going to use Illumina data as our main sequencing platform for the majority of our samples, and nanopore data that was much more agile and much faster to get from sample reception to uh, actual sequences as our outbreak platform to study specific outbreaks and not just uh, you know, uh, regular surveillance of samples. So in June 18, uh, actually was our first sequencing run of an outbreak using the Nanopore platform. And uh, in parallel, while we were doing this outbreak analysis, we were also kind of trying to get a sense of the, the factors that could affect the quality of the data. One of those factors is the CT value, which is a measure of the viral load in a patient when they get diagnosed. And we realized that the higher the CT value, uh, which counterintuitively means that you have less virus in, in your body when you were diagnosed, that that has a, an impact on the percentage of uh, host reads in the data. So the less virus that you have, the more host reads that you, we obtain. And it also impacts the quality of the sequences that we are able to produce. Um, in June 22nd, it was the first day since March that there were no recorded deaths for the virus in Quebec. And around that time, we had settled on a first data freeze of our uh, data set consisting of more or less 
750 consensus sequences that we selected from our initial phase of the project to publish into GISAID to do an initial phylogenetic analysis of how the pandemic began. So we settled on this data set and the, the people that we collaborated with Jesse Shapiro's lab and Carmen from Jesse Shapiro's lab started their work around this time to study the, in the beginning of the pandemic in Quebec from a phylogenetic perspective. Um, it was around that time that the public health uh, ministry announced that the bars were reopening, uh, parks, water parks, and uh, obviously with a lot of guidelines uh, for prevention of transmission, but it was around that time that uh, there was some uh, respite in, in the province for, for the pandemic. But of course, outbreaks were still happening. We sequenced our second outbreak in July 2nd. And uh, then around that time, we were also finalizing our pipelines to publish them as a release for uh, in preparation for the production runs that we had decided we're going to go with Illumina. Um, and in parallel, Moderna started its vaccine trials around this time uh, to test their mRNA vaccine. So August and September were still the summer. The pandemic wasn't as bad. And we were still hard at work. We began our production phase. We published our final pipelines into to, uh, Bitbucket, uh, kind of like a GitHub repository. We were still sequencing outbreaks, but we were also starting this very uh, massive uh, uh, sequencing effort. The first eight plates, which represented around 700 samples, were processed and the libraries were prepared so that the first production one could go in mid-August. Uh, so as I mentioned, we had 750 sequences more or less included in our first analysis. That was more or less the number of sequences that we were doing in a single run around this time uh, as we moved on into production. It was also around this time that things started again taking a turn for the worse. Um, uh, in parallel, as things were reopening, the new school cycle was beginning and the, in August 27th, it, uh, students returned to their schools. Uh, with some provisions to to prevent transmission, but also some omissions that were well, we're still seeing trying to assess the impact. Um, we continue our uh, sequencing with a second production run at the end of August, and around this time, Jesse Shapiro uh, published uh, on behalf of our consortium the results of our analyses regarding the introduction of the virus into Quebec. Uh, onto virological.org, this, this blog that I mentioned earlier. Um, it was also unfortunately around that time that it was very clear that we were starting a second wave of the pandemic. Uh, by September 30th, Montreal got uh, tagged the red zone and a lot of things were ordered to close. Um, so you can see the numbers starting to rise towards the end of September once again. So just to go a little bit into what the phylogenetic analysis that we performed revealed, and this is work again, uh, mostly done uh, with collaboration with uh, Jesse Shapiro's lab and Carmen produced these beautiful plots showing how the, the introduction of the virus uh, follows and is consistent with common spring break travel destinations. So as opposed to other places where when you look at the, the strains or the clades of the virus that, that were found at the beginning of their pandemics that were com coming mostly from China, that wasn't the case in, in Quebec. The cases that we saw first in Quebec were coming from Latin America, from uh, USA, from uh, France, from uh, other places in Europe. So places that are consistent with the kind of destinations that um, uh, Quebecois people go to in spring break giving some evidence to the theory that the pandemic hit Quebec really bad during the first wave because of that early spring break period that I mentioned uh, a few moments ago. So uh, one, one important thing to note is that these strains that were prevalent at the early stages of the pandemic that we're showing here as we classify them, these are strains that were seen in Europe. So even though you know, cases were detected in Latin America or the Caribbean, these were actually strains that were being imported from Europe essentially in the end. Um, uh, the key or the big one is one called B.1. 
uh, in the pangolin nomenclature um, or the 20 clade, 2020 clade, so 20A, 20B, 20C clades that uh, in next strain call, as next strain called them. Uh, these are the, the, the clades or the lineages that we're seeing in Quebec at the beginning of the pandemic. All of this work, of course, is, is available for you to consult in the vi uh, virological.org. And it's a very interesting, it's the first big results that we obtained from, from this project. Um, but that didn't mean that the work was over for us. Unfortunately, it was just beginning because uh, by October and November, it was very clear that we were in a second wave. The number of cases was going up really fast. Unfortunately, the cumulative deaths started to increase again. And uh, it was no, nothing was more symbolic of how the second wave was starting to affect everyone again than you know the, even the U.S. president testing positive around this time for COVID-19. So uh, Quebec government obviously re responds trying to an announce additional measures to reduce transmission. A lot of sporting facilities are closed. High school students are asked to wear masks all the time uh, while they're at school. On our end, we are into our production phase, uh, well into our production phase, and we're starting to see some of the initial results uh, from a technical perspective of the production and adjusting our pipeline uh, slightly to better uh, um, analyze these production runs. Uh, throughout October, we do two more production runs and another outbreak run. And then um, around it, it initial, uh, days of November, there's a new version of the IVAR software that we use to detect variants that is published. It is uh, specifically published to address some concerns that we had been seeing regarding the variants that we detect in primary regions that seem to be giving us issues. We, we were observing a lot of false positives um, in the primary regions and other kinds of uh, abnormalities that, that the IVAR developers were very uh, keen in addressing to improve the results. A lot of this was based on feedback that we gave in addition to Jared Simpson's lab at the OICR in Ontario. So because this new version of the, the variant color that we had was essentially published in November, we had to update our pipeline and reanalyze everything that we had produced at, at that until that time so that we could um, have better confidence in our results. So uh, it was also around this time that a little bit of hope started happening because that's when Pfizer announced that their vaccine candidate had 90% efficacy and they were applying uh, to the FDA for emergency approval. Moderna and did a similar announcement a few days later. Um, on our end, we were working very hard to update our pipelines, to validate them, to make sure that we weren't introducing any additional errors by updating the software, increasing the stringency of the dehosting. And uh, then um, towards the end of November, with our new pipeline uh, validated by all the stakeholders, we started the full reanalysis of our data set with this new uh, pipeline. At around that time was when Quebec announced their intentions of allowing 10 people reunions during the holiday season. But of course, we know down the line, that's not how it turned out. Um, as I mentioned, during October and November were some interesting months for us because we were deep into our production phase and we started noticing not just us, but across all sequencing centers, some problems when working with COVID. Uh, one of the problems, for example, was that there were some suspect suspicion of contamination that we detected using our negative controls. So we kind of started seeing not just us at the Genome Center at McGill, but uh, throughout Canada, at least um, that we with other labs that we spoke, we started seeing cases of, for example, a low coverage um, throughout the genome in a negative control. So you have a very, very low coverage, uh, as you can see in this in this uh, abundance plot. But really spread out across the genome or other cases where you had one amplicon that really amplified so you had like a 75,000 x coverage of that one amplicon in a negative control and everything else being empty um, we were not the only ones to see this of course there uh, were other cases it's a virus it's very tricky to work with and that's very easy to get contamination one of the things that i tell people when 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 reading some of these uh, articles that are published now one thing to be very critical about, especially those that haven't gone through peer review, is that contamination needs to be very well addressed and not just in the in the results that you publish, but throughout the chain 
um, because it's very, very easy for a sample to become contaminated with COVID. And then, of course, if you're using an amplicon, you will end up amplifying whatever it is that was there. Um, in our case, we could point to potential cases of like centrifuges that could be contaminated or uh, the liquid handling system that could be splashing around that could be ca causing some of these issues that we started detecting. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, I don't know why. Uh, give me a second. Uh, oh, I don't know why these didn't load. Um, uh, give me a second as I try to reload the presentation because these slides are kind of important. Um, yeah. There we go. Uh, apologies for that. Um, okay, so on our end, we had started noticing that in our production runs, um, the quality of the samples that we were getting was starting to become problematic. So this is the production runs that we had in order, uh, starting from the first production run that I told you about uh, in, in mid-August to, you know, the, the two that we did two in, in October and one that we did in November. And the colors really show the quality of the sequences that we were getting. And if you see towards October, we started seeing a high percentage of our sequences having insufficient quality for, for analysis. Um, and we were wondering why that was. One thing that we noticed in parallel was that these two runs were mostly consisting of samples that were obtained from specific sampling sites um, that were different to the sampling sites at the beginning of our production runs. So we suspected that there was maybe some bias due to sampling site in, in, the, in the quality of our, of our metrics. So if you see here, um, sampling site two and sampling site four, the green represents the number of sequences that pass compared to the total sequences that were analyzed. And the percentage was very low, 39% um, for site two and 16% for site four. Um, and at the same time, the lab was noticing that uh, the PCR reaction that they do to amplify uh, was having very low concentrations after finishing. So, you know, site six, for example, that has 63% success rate had a relatively high uh, average concentration of the PCR after preparing the libraries, but sites two and four had much, much lower uh, concentrations. And we realized that in, in Quebec in particular, because we don't have CT values for every sample that we get, that we needed kind of like a way to pre-assess the quality of a sequence before putting it into the sequencer because we were getting so many of these failed sequences. So by plotting, you know, the concentration of PCR um, after the, the reaction and the percentage of N, or so the missing part of the consensus, we noticed that the lower your PCR concentration, the much higher percent that's missing in your sample. So the lower quality, essentially. We could set a threshold of around 20 nanograms per microliter to ensure that samples that had less than this concentration were not even sequenced. And our last production run of the year, after doing this kind of pre-selection, we greatly increased the percentage of passing sequence. You can see that almost all of the sequences passed with a few flagged cases for some QC that needs to be verified and very low percentage of rejected sequences. Um, and as we approach the end of the year, again, a lot of things start happening very fast. So the pandemic is obviously in a full-blown second wave. The Quebec government rolls back its plans for the holidays. But in parallel, the good news is that Pfizer gets approval for its mRNA vaccine and the vaccination uh, campaign in Canada and in Quebec begins on December 14. Um, on our end, it's when we also finished doing the reprocessing that I was talking about, 
all of the data the, from the production runs was reprocessed with the latest version of our pipelines. But something happened right as we were about to go into the holidays and that many of you might remember. Um, in December 15, uh, there were some reports from the UK consortium about a uh, lineage with a mutation in the spike protein that was concerning. And three days later, they published a preprint and a blog post on um, virological.org that they had evidence that this lineage, the B, famous B117 lineage, had increased transmissibility. Um, so obviously, we went back to our data set to see if we had any cases of that in Quebec. And at, by 20 of, this, of December, our consortium uh, confirmed that there were no cases of these new UK and South African lineages in our data set up to that day. But of course, we didn't necessarily have very recent sequences to, to compare it to. So there was still this lingering question of whether there were cases in Canada. But the government reacted quickly. They, this time they closed the border with the UK uh, only two days after this announcement. And uh, by December 26th, Ontario had confirmed two cases of the B117 uh, lineage. At that same day, there was a case, suspected case that arrived at the McGill Genome Center that Sarah from Yanis's group began preparing right away to try to get confirmation of whether it was or not. And on December 28th, the sequencing run finished. Uh, we ran our pipeline and we could confirm that there was at least one case of that lineage detected in Quebec using the nanopore technology. And there was obviously some news reports. This was our project. This was work that was done at the McGill Genome Center. Uh, so for those of you that saw the news, um, this was something that we were doing on our end. So to wrap up the, the talk, the year ends on December 31st, 2020. Um, it, it's not good news. Unfortunately, by then, we were averaging 2,500 2, cases per day. A cumulative 2, uh, 200,000 cases of COVID-19 in Quebec with uh, approximately 8,200 deaths attributed to the virus in the year 2020. In Canada, the numbers are uh, obviously higher. We had uh, almost 600,000 cases of COVID in the year 2020 with approximately 15,000 deaths attributed to the virus. Um, but I'm putting a picture here by a Mexican painter, Diego Rivera, where he shows kind of like a nativity scene, but it's not a nativity scene. It's a group of scientists working and a nurse and a doctor administering some of the first vaccines to a child. Um, and he frames it this way because vaccines really are a miracle of science. They have been such a useful tool for preventing this kind of work. And uh, I thought it was very appropriate that, that as we end the year, we are also thankful for the things that we were able to accomplish within a year. Um, 95,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccines were administered in Canada by the end of 2020 with approximately 9.9 .9 doses worldwide that have been administered by the year by the end of the year. So uh, the, the numbers are obviously very high. There has been enormous loss attributed to the virus, but there has also been a lot of work. On the COVID project side, we did more than 50 sequencing runs, sequenced more than 6,400 samples during the year, six production runs, and we published more than 750 sequences in GISAID for, from the province of Quebec. And in conclusion, a lot can happen in a year. It is very difficult to make decisions. When you see them chronologically, you can see you know, how we were making decisions with very limited information, with very intense public scrutiny. But one thing that I wanna highlight is the importance of open science and the importance of open data to understanding this virus and reacting to the problem on time. Collaboration across provinces, across countries was crucial to make informed decisions, to react, to be able to advance science. And basic science was really the reason why we have a vaccine candidate to begin with. The work that was done with other coronaviruses, with other potential mRNA vaccines, was the reason we have a vaccine so fast. And just in general, for people at the Genome Center and across McGill, people working in science and doing their part, our contributions have been and will continue to make an impact for the response of our province and the country and the world to the COVID pandemic. And with that, I would like to acknowledge a lot of people that contributed to this work. I had to summarize a lot of things. So credit to credit where credit is due. People from our group at C3G named here at the McGill Genome Center. So many people involved in the sequencing and the analysis um, and the preparation of samples. 
uh, and at the Laboratoire Santé Publique de Quebec, Sandrine Moreira, who is the lead of this project from the LSPQ, and uh, Eric Fournier, a bioinformatician there that's also helping us. So with that, I open the floor to questions and thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the, the, the presentation, Hector. Uh, are, are you able to hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I think admittedly I'm coming from doing my medical training over in the U.S., but like as you know, now I'm here over in Quebec. Um, I was just wondering if you could just try to help me better understand the statistics regarding the number of cases in Quebec, because I think, uh, I think it's pretty easy for me to get overwhelmed by the insane number of cases and deaths that happen every day in the U.S. So you mean comparatively uh, to the U.S.? Uh, I think in Quebec, the numbers are, are not, uh, when you take the U.S. as a whole uh, per capita, I think the numbers are, are worse than the ones that we're reporting even in Quebec. Uh, obviously, at different points in the pandemic, some places were at, at spikes in the outbreaks and others weren't. But just as an overall measure, um, I can say, I think, relatively speaking, Canada and Quebec didn't have as bad numbers as those that were coming out of the U.S. Well, it, it kind of looks like the, the East Coast uh, states. So we're kind of the we would be like one of the be better East Coast states if we were part of the United States. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the chat window open, so I can't see if people are raising their hands. Could someone uh, at the in the chair kind of or open your mics if you have a question? Well, I, I have one for you, uh, um, Hector. So you say in hindsight, uh, um, vision is to, like it's 2020. Um, but what are your what is your take on that? What should you think should have been done a bit differently, even if it's maybe it's not a good idea to do it. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, we can all say from a personal level, from a government level, we all have, quote unquote, regrets from the past year. Obviously, as the pandemic has moved on, we know much more than we knew back then. And if we look back, there are always things that we could have done differently. I do think that one key thing that wasn't very clear at the start was how contagious this virus was, specifically with asymptomatic patients. So, um, you know, February, which a lot of people seem to be coming down on as the month that we could have really done something to prevent the spread of this virus was, I think, a, a part of the pandemic where a lot of things could have gone differently. We had tested much, much more than we did, but we weren't testing at the levels that we needed to be testing to catch the asymptomatic cases. And we didn't close borders, uh, not just Canada, the world didn't really close borders until March. So by not detecting the cases and by allowing the virus to spread, it was really where I think things started going uh, to a point where it was very difficult to control. So that's just one thing, but obviously there are a number of things that could have been done differently. Uh, as I mentioned at a personal level, government level, it's always very difficult to say in hindsight because you have more information that you did that you did then. Uh, Hector, uh, there's a question in the chat session from uh, Somaya. Uh, yeah, Somaya says, uh, did you find any correlation between phylogenetic cluster with the severity of the diseases? So uh, I'm only presenting virus seq uh, data. So this is just the data that we have from sequencing the virus. Um, we don't, I'll, I haven't been doing necessarily a systematic comparison between outcome in patients. That's another component of the project called HostSeq, where they do sequence human uh, samples and kind of compare clinical outcomes to the viral uh, information. There are groups that are doing that. I'm not presenting any of that, and I'm uh, frankly not as well informed in that regard. But uh, I, I very specifically, at least as far as I know, with the early clades of the virus, there wasn't any associated um, risk of one lineage being more uh, deadly than another. Of course, as we see more and more lineages emerge and more mutations emerge, that might change, hopefully not, but it's something that definitely needs to be monitored for sure. Uh, next question is from uh, Fatima. Go ahead, Fatima. Hi, Hector, awesome talk, that was great. 
Um, could you Thank go you. back to the slide where you were talking about the CT, the co correlation with the CT value? Yeah. So, uh, here? Uh, no. Well, uh, um, so just here's, a, I'll, I'll frame my question and, and, and you'll see. So we know CT value is sort of an indirect measurement of the viral load because it's highly dependent on when actually the patient was swabbed, which, at which, which point during the course of infection where they swabbed. I wanted to know if you actually have data or collected data or, or were given this data as to, you know, each, each sample um, was collected at which point? Um, in the infection? In the infection. Did, does public health share that information with you so that you can make a model? Uh, well, I, I'm not sure we already have that kind of information to that level of granularity. What you're mentioning is very important because yes, of course the CT value will depend on what point in the in, uh, infection of a particular patient you detect the, the virus. If you detect it very early on, before they start showing symptoms, for example, the CT value might be very high because they just don't have that many viral particles in their, in their body. But uh, you know, it, it's been very hard to find data sets and not just in Quebec, but worldwide of cases where they're detected early enough in their infection that you can actually follow the progression of the CT value throughout their infection. I don't think we have cases like that in, 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 in our data set for sure. Um, if, if that's what you were suggesting. Yeah, I thought, um, I mean, in, in genetics and genomics, we love to make models and, <laughs> and pipelines. So I thought it would be very cool if you, if you have access to a data set like that and, and you model how fluctuations in CT actually affect your read. And your ability. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure some people have done that. Specifically, the labs that produce these, these PCR tests are probably doing the kind, that kind of analysis uh, to improve their, their, their methods, or they did it at some point. But uh, you know, the, the CoveSeq project and the ViralSeq project has been mostly framed as a surveillance project and, and investigation of outbreaks. So for those kinds of applications, we only really care about the actual quality of the data that we're getting uh, in the end for the consensus sequence and for the ability to detect variants, but not necessarily the internal progression of the disease with particularity of the CT value. I don't think that's something that we've looked at in our group at least. Right, and now that you bring up surveillance, I was also wondering if you have any updates on the, I know it just started, but on the um, uh, basically wastewater surveillance uh, the updates on the wastewater surveillance that I can share here right now, I don't unfortunately don't have any. Um, I think we you will hear about that at some point soon in the future. But right now, the only thing I can say is that we're we're going to be looking into that for sure, and their projects and very interesting proposals, but nothing concrete yet to share. Uh, one, there's one last question in the chat session from Lee N. Mm -hmm. So. I can read it. Uh, could you give a bit more explanation about the issues you had with primary regions using the previous version of IVAR tool? Yes, for sure. Um, so uh, I'm going to go back to here um, because this this cartoon actually helps explain this point kind of a bit better. Um, so with uh, short reads, um, remember the IVAR software we only use with Illumina data, you don't cover the full amplicon, the, the, at least not the Arctic amplicons when you are sequencing. You, the am amplicons are about 450 basis in size, so you don't have reads that are that size in, in short reads. So what ends up happening is that you have fragments that, that map different parts of the amplicon. And when you get uh, fragments that are overlapping with the primary regions, it becomes very hard to tell if the read that you're getting is coming from, I don't know, amplicon 40 or Amplicon 47 if the majority of the read is falling in the primary region, which can cause a problem because we know um, the primers are up here and the overlap is here, but we know that primers and PCR reactions can often introduce um, uh, uh, aberrations into the, the sequences. So 
if you are actually sequencing the primer, then you're not really sequencing maybe a, a variant that was present in the virus to begin with. So what the main change was essentially uh, in the way that the trimming is done and the way the, the, ver the reads are assigned to variant calling in IVAR so that reads that fall within these regions are um, more strictly trimmed to avoid keeping the primary regions, but also discarding, for example, what are discordant paired and reads. So where one pair of the read uh, of the two pairs um, that fall one in one amplicon and another in an amplicon, because that's indicative of maybe uh, an, an amplicon that was a chimera to begin with, which are amplicons that we shouldn't be analyzing anyway. Um, so that, uh, so the better trimming of the primary regions and the, the elimination of potential chimeric reads when you met when they map to different amplicons and the two reads that those are the two main changes I think uh, that were being done to Ivar when when we did the up, when they did the update. And there were also some changes about how the consensus is generated and a few more technical details, but I think the, the main idea that I want to put across is that. I think uh, we are running out of time. Yeah, we're I think seven minutes over. But uh, just before we everyone... end, just yeah. before we end the meeting, I'd like to thank you again, Hector, for a wonderful presentation. You've really done a great job putting your work into uh, and and others' work into context. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. And uh, thank you. We'll, we'll hopefully we'll be in touch regarding next week. Goodbye. <laughs>